question. Um, first of all, let me just talk a little bit about the road index because that's something that the uh, great has been addressed a little bit. You know, I've done some background on me. I'm actually a uh, landowner myself in Pennsylvania. I, I actually own property right at the top of here uh, in that DRBC region he's talking about. I leased my land back in 2008. Uh, we're still waiting for the DRBC to pop up with regulations on that. Can you speak up just a little bit? You can speak up just a little bit. When it's warmed up again, I'll shut this off. It's a little cold with that. So in 2008, I leased my land, and I'm waiting on the DRBC for the regulations. The uh, reason I got involved in this industry is I have a consulting business, and I've been working in working in Pennsylvania for several decades, and I've been working in my various towns. And I got involved with gas, I signed my lease, and I became concerned because of the way things were going politically on this. I was really involved, uh, kind of working for my consulting business, and the first one all and along the way got hired by Energy Indep because they saw what I was doing in gas So I've been representing Energy Indep, which is an industry sponsored organization, but there's no doubt I'm here speaking on behalf of industry uh, as to this. However, I also speak as a landowner. And one of the things that you've done with our energy and depth program, we cover both New York and Pennsylvania, uh, what I'm doing, uh, and the uh, Rachel Powell, and some things that we And we, what we have done is we've gathered a lot of data, we've tried to provide a lot of information to the public about this industry and what it involves, and correct a lot of this. And one of the things that's most important to me is the economic impact. How the economic impacts of like they get compensated? And one of the things that Greg brought up, of course, was the road. Uh, are there road impacts? To be sure, there are road impacts. However, the industry has put several hundred million dollars, probably in northeast of Pennsylvania, probably over a billion dollars, into road improvements. And most of those road improvements have been made prior to the gas drought. So you can go into various communities in Bradford County. I spoke to a supervisor there probably a year and a half ago at a meeting, and uh, he was uh, he was pretty pro gas, but he wasn't he was, wasn't uh, extremely pro gas. And he said to me, he said, you know, to be honest with you, he said I was concerned about this. But we would not be able to have maintained our roads and brought them up to the condition they're in today had we not had the gas room because Chesapeake, which was the primary company operating in that area. <coughs> was able to invest, again, millions of dollars into upgrading their roads. And I see that. I see that in various areas of northeastern Pennsylvania where the road conditions have improved as a result of gas drilling. Are there, is there truck traffic? Are there delays? Are there temporary inconveniences? Are there situations that, that uh, where roads are damaged for, uh, that have to be repaired? Yes, of course. All those things do happen. However, the net effect of that is an overall improvement of roads. And I'd be happy to take any one of you on a tour of northeastern Pennsylvania and show you instances of that. Uh, and one of the ways you do that is through road use agreements. Road use agreements are an alternative to the bonding approach. Uh, communities of both New York and Pennsylvania have the ability to bond roads, to, to uh, set limits, weight limits, and things like that, and to require people to exceed those weight limits to post bonds for damages. Uh, you can do that. Uh, that's perfectly legal to do that. The problem is when you do that, you're going to run into conflicts with other vehicles, uh, such as uh, milk trucks, for example, and uh, stone trucks and things of that sort. And most people don't want to do that. So the way to get around that, and it's done for both, and I've represented wind companies, by the way, too, in projects in New York State and Pennsylvania. And it's the same technique for both gas and for uh, wind projects. You make a uh, deal with the community, essentially up front, to say, we're going to evaluate the standards of that road before we proceed. We're going to document what the conditions are. And then we'll compensate you for any damage. Or, and a better situation is, we will improve that road to a condition that we can take the traffic that we're going to put on it prior to doing it. That's the proper way to do it. And then to make any corrections after the fact of their damages. So that's what you do. And there are many models, not something where you need to reinvent the wheel. There are many models and drafts out there. You can pick and choose. And you always have the ability to do the bonding thing as leverage. So if you're trying to uh, say, well, 
how are we going to get a company to do it? Well, you have the ultimate leverage. You have the ability to post the bond. Uh, but what you really want to do is get that private agreement because you're going to get a lot more out of that uh, at the end of the day. And virtually all the companies that I know, all the companies, not virtually, all the companies that I've had any uh, doings with have been very amenable to doing that, and there are multiple instances of it. I'll just mention very quickly a couple other things. Because we did some analysis of data. Uh, one of the things I do is a lot of economic impact research for uh, various uh, things, such as, for example, at New York State, I did a uh, study uh, several years ago on the economic impact of the deer farm industry, for example. And one of the things we look at when we look at these kinds of things is to look at data from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. And we looked at data for uh, these three counties, Rome, Tioga, and Shimon, which is from Binghamton to Elmira. And we looked at Bradford and Susquehanna, which is essentially Tawanda, Montrose, and that area. Bradford and Susquehanna are the two big producers, as Brayden said, in the northern tier. They're not the only ones. Tioga and, and, and Lycoming are also big. But those are the two big ones okay, that really produce the gas. And these counties, if you notice, the borders are just about the same. They extend the same area. So you're looking at the two sides of the border, the twin tier. You're looking at the southern tier in New York State, and below that, the northern tier in Pennsylvania. And we looked at the uh, data. And I have several, a presentation that includes several charts. Let me just mention a couple of key statistics. Um, first of all, when we look at the number of employees, in a second, I want to get to that. Okay. We looked at the employees from 2001 to 2011 in those areas and compared them. In the uh, New York State side, on the, north, on the southern tier side, those counties over that period lost 13,000 jobs. While the two counties on the Pennsylvania side, which are much smaller population to start with, gained 1,645 jobs for an increase of 5.2%. Now that's over a 10 year period. <coughs> then we look at wages. Wages on the New York State side, these three counties, the wages uh, from uh, 2008 went down 1.2%. On the Bradford and Susquehanna side, the Pennsylvania side, they went up simultaneously, again, a much smaller base, by 28%. And when you compare the numbers, the actual numbers, New York State lost about $70 million in wages, while those two little counties in northern Pennsylvania gained $278 million in wages. That's what this industry does for an average. Now, Braden has gone through, I think, very professionally what, the, what this involves. Uh, and I think he's given you a very, I think, pretty neutral perspective on it in terms of what it involves. And I think it's very good. Uh, the bottom line is and that when we look at this from a nationwide perspective across the entire United States, there is not, and I know there's a lot of people trying to assert otherwise because they're trying to use fracking as a term to cover the entire industry. But the truth is, hydraulic fracturing has never looted a water supply in the United States. Oh, not, you, can laugh, you can laugh all you want, but that is a documented fact. That is a documented fact attested to by several states by the EPA. That is a fact. That, that, that is not correct. There is, it is a fact that there is no water supply in the United States of America that's been polluted by hydraulic fracture. Now, what about the exploration of natural gas? Well, let me, let, me answer, let me answer what I know you're all going to say. You're going to say, well, there's a spill, or there's that, or there's no, this. No, all no. those things have to do with natural gas development in general. They do not have to do with hydraulic fracking. Well, let's talk about and what we have And what we've had happen as a result of gas. Let me talk. Will you please? Wait, wait, wait. Gonna, I'm going to shut up another. One at a time. Let me, let me answer, answer. What you've had as a result of the movie Gas is you've had, you've had people complain uh, what is, they took that flaming faucet, which was a lie, by the way. That in fact, the Colorado State said that that had nothing to do with gas. Nothing. So, Chef, so would you like and, to drink? And what happened was that he took that and presented an image in the public's mind that somehow that was a result of hydraulic fracturing. It was not. It had nothing to do not only with hydraulic fracturing, but nothing to do with gas. And that's where we've started down this road. Now, I see Craig holding up that jump. Mm -hmm. Now, let me tell you something. Zimmick, 
He comes from down here. That jug, which his buddy held up all over the place, and he's held up. It's everywhere. not my buddy's. That's uh, Ray Kimball's. Yeah. Ray well, whatever. Doesn't matter. That water has been tested. The Sautner's water, which they ran around with that jug everywhere, that was tested by the EPA. And that water turned out to be safe. The and EPA, that was retested by the EPA, EPA and found out unsafe. The EPA tested that water and found that it was safe. How about That's the bottom line. Army? The How EPA tested it and found that it was safe. Were you called along? Why don't you be quiet and let it talk? Yeah. And you will see that, you at that, now that we've got it sprouted up a little bit, we'll uh, we'll turn it back to the break. Okay. <laughs> okay. If you want to bear with me for maybe another ten minutes, I want to run through uh, some of the other items, which uh, some the of which I can do have about ten minutes. Let's just speak up and continue. How's that? Um, one of the uh, issues has been radiation naturally occurring radioactive elements in the black shale. If you look in the environmental impact statement, the draft environmental impact statement, the state of New York tested some of these loads that were going to the landfill with the Geiger counter. They also tested samples in the state's repository, it's in Rensselaer, uh, as well as some outcrops. And it states, I can read from the environmental impact statement, that there were levels essentially equal to background values that do not indicate any exposure concern for workers or the general public. I'll go further than that. The Marcellus Shale, as you can see by this line up here, outcrop extends all the way across the state. In the town of Fayette, when you're Standing in your field looking at the black shale, you're standing on the Marcellus. All the creeks up there, um, even uh, all of the lakes are in contact with the Marcellus formation. Now, one of my detractors wrote in, the, in a letter to the editor that the formations on the surface are not the same as the formations at the same formation at depth. I don't want to take issue with that. They are. There are a few subtle differences. One of them is the radioactive element radon. The reason for that is radon is water soluble. It's one of the radioactive elements that shows up in what we call the production water that we get over time uh, from the Marcellus Shale, presumably also from the Utica, although uh, we don't know that yet. Um, the, production water does have elevated levels of radioactivity. Apparently in Pennsylvania, somebody said that they have open pits of production water. In New York, that's been illegal for at least 20 years. All production water has to be contained in a tank and disposed of by a licensed hauler. Most of it is trucked to Pennsylvania uh, for disposal. Um, most production brine in this area is not salty enough to be used for road spreading. There is some in western New York that is, but uh, most of the uh, uh, production brine uh, in, in this area is not. Um, in fact, brine is probably a misnomer. Uh, it's salty, uh, but, but not uh, a, good, a good heavy brine for uh, dust control and for ice control. In New York State, by the way, if you're going to road spread any kind of uh, salty fluid, you have to have a permit that specifies the roads on which they're spread. You just can't take off and, and uh, spread them. In New York, we also have, uh, uh, we only have two disposal wells that take production brine. My personal opinion, that's the place to put it. Put it back where it came from. Um, however, in New York, we do not. Depending on whose numbers you want to believe, there are between 40,000 and 155,000 disposal wells in the United States for <coughs> production fluids. And uh, I think the state of Pennsylvania has a, a dozen or something like that, which are commercial. The um, state of Ohio has a bunch. Uh, Midwest, Southwest is where the, where the bulk of them are. Uh, I think we will probably, uh, if we go forward with Marcellus development, uh, 
uh, probably entertain uh, the development of some here. Um, my personal opinion, that's the place to put the stuff. Look back where it came from. Um, that's an opinion. Going forward, the there have been about 6,000 wells drilled in Pennsylvania from our cell scale. That flooded the market. If drilling continues elsewhere, how many wells do we need, even if we open up New York, to, to gas well drilling to keep the pipelines full? If we don't do any large amounts of exporting, which isn't going to happen anytime soon, but could ultimately happen, you probably need less than a thousand Marcellus wells a year, New York and Pennsylvania, uh, to maintain present levels of usage. If you get into conservation, uh, use less, promote solar, uh, wind energy, whatever, um, the demand would be less than that. There was a slide presented uh, last Thursday night uh, regarding the Oil Company has a large lease position in Tioga County. Um, that lease position could keep the pipelines full all by itself for a number of years if it were fully developed. And uh, uh, in, in a situation like that, I believe they're willing to willing landowners. Um, and quite honestly, whether New York produces gas or not, the industry will survive. But some of the landowners may have some difficulties because all of this ultimately comes back to money. Why would you lease if you don't need the money? If your kids' education is secure, if your grandkids can go to college of their choice, um, you got plenty of money, what do you need? Why, why lease? Greed. Yeah, money. You, you, you lease, most people lease with the expectation of some kind of financial return. And so, I believe in a free country you ought to have the option to do that. Now, that doesn't mean that I can do something that will impact my neighbor. That's why we work at creating redundant systems and as Tom pointed out, the problems are not in the well. I've actually recovered casing from two, three thousand feet of depth, pull it out with a drill rig. Been in salt water for 20 years. There's no oxygen down there. The stuff comes out like it's brand new. You can still see the chalk marks on the side of it where we numbered the pipe. It sits on the rack two days on location. It looks like this. The, the presence of oxygen is what creates the control erosion problems. And because mankind is involved, we're the ones that spill stuff. Most of the problems and the contamination of water wells, if they in fact exist and there are some, have all occurred from spilling stuff on the surface. And I proposed in my letter to the editor of the opinion piece there a couple months ago that we have uh, um, lake friendly gas well sites, just the same as we have lake friendly farms. I got the idea of driving down the radio and I, there's a sign in front of one of the lineups. Believe it or not, I opened the computer last week. There's a group in West Virginia um, that just made that deal with the Shell Oil and a number of operators down there. They're going to create an independent group to review um, their drill site operations, a voluntary program. Um, to create some credibility, if you will, uh, for their operations. And, and, you know, quite frankly, the best way to avoid an environmental problem is don't have anything there. It's going to be an environmental problem if you spill it. Mercury and lead are good examples, but there's lots of others. Um, wells can be fracked with the biodegradable materials. Why don't we do it? Because the chemicals that we've used are cheaper. But as uh, has been pointed out, the chemicals are there to, create, to reduce friction so we can pump the fluid easier, less horsepower. And the chemicals are also there to help carry this stuff so we can get it where we want it. And, uh, um, and I maintain that once you put them here, other than the part that flows back, they're going to stay there. They're going to stay there for the same reason the gas stayed there for the last 300 million years. It's confined. And so the problems are on the surface. If, if, if there are problems, 
Um, they're on the surface. So, um, the flip side, I guess the, the last thing to, to say here is, uh, uh, actually the last thing here, believe it or not, is to uh, tell a little story. My great uncle lived at the mouth of Black River by Watertown. 1903, I'm not sure the exact year, he told the story. Uh, the first gasoline-powered motorboat on Lake Ontario came for a visit. They knew it was coming. The village fathers were so afraid of that boat blowing up and burning up the town, they made him anchor out in the middle of the river and they sent a rowboat out to get him. I told that story to a couple of people here a year ago, and they uh, said, oh yeah, it was like that when rural electrification went on around here. Now, I'm not old enough to remember that, but I was telling that to a person who was, and they said, oh yeah, there were a lot of people like that. Um, it's, it's almost some identification with things you're familiar with. Uh, you know, is electricity perfectly safe? No, people get electrocuted now and then. Um, I, the most dangerous thing I do is get my vehicle and drive through the drill ring. Once I'm there, accidents can happen. The uh, workman's comp rate on drill rates is about the same as it is for farming. Um, <coughs> so, you know, accidents happen, people get hurt. Um, as a geologist for the last 30 plus years, I've been in the business of fixing <laughs> It's 
it's capable of creating silicosis, yes. It causes silicosis, correct? And it's capable of it, yes. It's capable of causing silicosis, which is lung cancer, right? So you uh, are changing. I'm not, a, I'm not a medical expert, so I'll, I'll refrain from that. But, okay, I think um, people got the answer. But, no, just remember what silica sand is. When you shovel sand out of a gravel pit, you're shoveling up approximately the sand fraction will be at least 80% percent silica. You're talking about particulates that you can't see that cause holes in the lung once you oh, yeah. it. No, silica is ubiquitous. Um, Just so everyone in here understands mm -hmm. what you're using on their property that they can never say no to. If this is your worst problem, you don't have it. No, you don't believe it. This is not building. Speed. Not the oil business. Um, it's about the gas business. They're the same. Yeah. Thank you guys for coming in on the Um I'm from Bradford County, and I would like to know how, you were talking about leasing a little bit, and I was wondering for up in New York State, how does the language differ from the leases that we were offered? Because I was wondering, will a gas company in New York State sign a lease that states that the landowner is to receive all royalties based on the highest point of sale? What I mean by that is we have seen um, royalties coming in that are based on the sale at the wellhead, but we also know that gas companies are paying royalties based on hedge point, which is $6. We also know that they are capable of paying on the line at the marketing price, which is $18, I'd see that. So in, in New York State, um, I was wondering, will a gas company sign a lease that has a language saying that the royalties will be derived from the highest point of sale? I, I don't know where you're getting $18, but um, the, uh, <laughs> we'd like some of that. Um, and, and I can't speak for gas companies. I, I don't represent one. Um, I work for them. Um, the, the leases should be, there's one other issue in leases as well that's even more important, and that's the lease royalty should be calculated on the gross receipts from the sale and not some of this language that says after taxes, after payout, etc. cetera. Um, even if it's only a one-eighth lease, you want to be a one-eighth lease. Most leases that I'm familiar with, and I'm not an attorney, uh, state one per, excuse me, state one-eighth, twelve and a half percent of the gross at the first sales point. Now there is a company running around Western New York that wants to pay the royalty on the net revenue. You never want to sign any kind of a contract where your payday depends on somebody else's bookkeeping, and I don't yeah. care whether you're selling well, gas, well, or that, soybeans, or you name it. Well, does that is that the language that is kind of talking about? See, in our area, we have Chesapeake operating, and they just created a company called Sun, which is Chesapeake Energy Marketing Incorporated. So what we're seeing is Chesapeake is selling to themselves, and our royalty is derived from that. So they're selling themselves. Is that, is that the is that the first sale? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so what happened is what I'm asking you is, so they're selling to semi a dollar, and our royalties are derived from that dollar. It's 12.5 percent, and then you add the uh, minus production costs and all that because some of the people have bad leases. So what I was asked, going to ask there is just talking about the net and gross and all that. Um, is it in New York State? Is it illegal to sell? receive royalties at a second-party sale or a third-party sale? I, I, it, it wouldn't be illegal because a lease is a contract. As, well, so as, again, I'm not an attorney. You need a better opinion than mine. But as I understand contract law, whatever is specified in the contract in terms of the sale point <laughs> would be what you receive. Well, some states have stepped in and um, said, look, because of the taxes on the royalties, we want uh, our landowners to receive from the third party sale, so therefore the gas company cannot sell the gas back to themselves at a second party sale. I'm not aware of any language to that effect in this state, but again, I'm not. No, no, no. Aware. I mean, uh, okay. It's I was just wondering if New York State was prepared for that or not. Typically in New York State, the only thing I can tell you about that, typically in New York State, the first purchaser 
submits a report to the state as to what they purchased and the and that was called a takers purchaser and takers report and the producer generates the same report um, as far as the revenue that would be dictated by the terms of the agreement I don't believe I'm unaware of any uh, language contract language that would Require a higher royalty rate or something of that nature, and there and it's a, it's a it's an issue because no, of lots sale. of people receive. Yeah, you're defining the point of sale. Yeah. Right. yeah. To yeah, my now, like I say, I'm not an attorney, so um, <coughs> somebody else would have to speak to that. Thank yes. you very much. Hi, my question is also about leases. My husband and I signed a gas lease before we knew about fracking, and we did take it to our attorney, who at that point knew nothing. Um, and we came to realize that we made a big mistake, that the, the language in the lease was uh, totally favorable to the gas company in a lot of ways. And I would just urge any of you who are considering leasing to be very cautious. Um, if you're thinking of signing a lease, you've got to remember it is an industrial process. It will have some risks. And what a lease can do is it can't prevent harm. It can give you the legal rights to sue them if they create harms that you've tried to protect against in your lease. But suing one of these big corporations is not anything to be taken lightly. Um, you know, what happens if, and it does happen, they use a part of your land that you told them they couldn't use. They're gonna sue them. What happens if they don't maintain fencing so your animals get into something, or your neighbors get into something, are you prepared to sue them? What happens if your well gets contaminated? And regardless of what Mr. Chetron said, there have been well contaminations, whether they're caused by the fracking or spills or whatever, there have been. Even then, you sue them, but that doesn't fix your water. So I just am urging you to be really cautious and think about it. And there are some publications. This thing just has a whole lot of questions that you need to ask yourself. How will you get enforcement of the provisions of your lease if you're able to write a lease that's a good one? And I guess my question would be to the two of you, are you, as far as I know, the Dillon Landowners Coalitions are trying to put together a, a good lease, a lease that has a lot of provisions in it to protect. Two things, one is the Landowner Coalition lawyer and leaders, they make money only when the lease is signed. So their interest is to get a lease signed. So you have to be pretty, you know, a little skeptical. Um, and the other thing is that, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> well, so basically my, my question is, are you aware that any leases have been signed that you think are protective of the landholders and the environment? <coughs> I don't think any of those have been signed. Not in so many words. Um, my experience in, in Pennsylvania and in, and in Western New York, most gas well operators try at least reasonably to protect fences, protect tile lines, protect roads. Um, there are always people who are disgruntled, unsatisfied, um, dissatisfied with whatever they got um, and I'm sure that goes far beyond the oil and gas industry um, there, there's lots of lots of litigation that involves lots of trespass and arguing in uh, uh, construction industries and, and probably farming and everything else so uh, sure a lease is a contract you should read the thing if you don't understand it get some advice um, I tell people X out the renewal clauses, X out the storage clauses. Um, and the reason for that is I want you to come back in five years or whatever the end of the primary term is, we'll renegotiate another bonus. Because I don't really care whether you drill on my property or not, making the judgment I don't think there's too much gas around here. I'll take the rental, the rental money, which is a sure thing, and uh, if the drilling happens, fine. If it doesn't, fine. That's that's my personal philosophy. Let me, let, me, let me grab a few. Let me just add, I want to add to that a little bit. I, I, I represented a coalition, like an informal group that I was in. And I would just say, you know, you need to operate as a group. You know, that's what you need to do. You need to work as a group. 
And we, in our case, I'll just mention, we, we added 23 addendums to the lease. We took the standard lease, we did exactly what he said, the X house, a bunch of things, and, uh, and then we added 23 addendums that we wanted to that lease, which addressed things like fencing and all that stuff. So, that's so what if I there was a violation, Tom, if they didn't obey what they were right. supposed to, does the lease that you signed say who's gonna take them to court? Yeah, there's an arbitration clause. Well, arbitration, I've been told, is terrible. Well, what you want to do is make sure the arbitration occurs locally, not in Texas. Well, so they, they can turn around and sue you, too. How about bonding? How about landowners well, requiring? You, you can do, I, I don't want to get too into it because I'm not a lawyer either. I can just tell you that the thing you should do is is organize as a group. You should you should consult somebody who's good at this, somebody who's uh, got a legal background, and insist on the addendum that you want. Is that uh -huh. something right? Um, you just said something that was really yeah. interesting, I thought. Um, you know, as farmers, I'm a farmer with Alabama County, and we were really worried about our fences and our tile, especially. You're right on. Right. Except why didn't you separate the surface agreement from the lease? Because what we found out later is if we say non-surface the surface, we also can negotiate what's called a surface use agreement. Like in right. Texas, they got $50,000 just the well paid out of the property. And then right. it was $10,000 per well that was put on there. We had, we had similar language, not quite that amount of money, but we had similar language in our lease. Oh, well, okay. So, so I, and the answer, that's exactly what we mean. Well, and, and, and no entry leases, which refer to no surface entry, uh, are not that rare uh, in New York. Uh, they're they're certainly, certainly done. Usually there's some kind of trade-off if you demand uh, no entry, you're probably not going to get as much bonus money as as if you don't. But you can make it up in your service use agreement. But but sure. Yeah, also add setbacks. Oh sure, no no, you can add setbacks. Uh, you can add uh, setbacks for your building, setbacks for your bonds, um, certain areas that are that are off limits, if you will. Um, let me let me go on. I mean, you can argue lease language forever. Let, let me go on. surface water. I mean, when the company, they sub this and they sub that, they send the dozer out, I mean, pile lines, you name it, but that's not addressed. I mean, mm -hmm. I had a lawyer who you buy the uh, lease, and uh, I think you really, you're, I've heard horror stories from Pennsylvania. You mentioned the shell thing, you know, that they're going to have future production. They held checks. They they canceled checks to some farmers, half a million dollars, where retired farmers were hoping to get the money. You know, Shell is just kind of waiting for the price to go up. Then they decide to pay them, and the thing is in litigation. You know, that's well, we had a similar situation in New York too, where leases were taken and then the money didn't follow through. Yeah. And I, I guess we need some real special lawyer. I mean, I'm not totally against. Well, no, no, no. The, the industry is not blameless in, in all of this. They've, they've, they've created a lot of their own problems, um, particularly through lease map. Uh, well, I I say in five leasemen. years, these wells, who knows what's left of them, you know, they, when they come in, they can change the topography even on the ground. I mean, uh, unless they really hold their feet to the fire, that's a problem. I, I think, and then I'll put in a pitch here for DDC in New York, I think they are much more capable of dealing with the industry than Pennsylvania has been to date. Now, there's been a lot of criticism, a lot of 
<coughs> negative comments about the EC. I dealt with them for, for 30 years. I want to tell you, you can mess with them, they don't mess with you. Uh, and the fines get pretty stiff pretty fast. So um, I ex And now we've had four years of sensitivity uh, accusations, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the, deep, the mineral resources group, as well as uh, uh, the environmental protection waters uh, group are, are fully capable of, of managing uh, any, any oil and gas drilling in this state. Incidentally, city of Buffalo water, you can't, you can't spill it on the ground legally because it doesn't meet DEC discharge requirements right what, now. What constituent? Hmm? What chemical? I don't know. But, uh, but I was told that uh, it does not meet DEC uh, regs right now. It tastes a little nasty. Um, let me, let, 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 me, uh, let me move on to some other ground up there. Yeah. I'd like to hear what that man over there had to say that had his arm up for like Well, 10 he, he spoke once, so I was just kind of moving my I'll get back to you. I'll come back. Let me go to this guy next. Why do you suppose every major city in New York State, including the two major watersheds, have banned tracking? The two major watersheds, you're talking about Syracuse and New York City, both of those watersheds have an exception to filtration. They do not have to filter water. Any other public treatment system in New York State has to filter the water. They can produce raw water to the city uh, without filtration. There's a, there's a lot of expensive filter their water. How about, it's it's how about all the major cities? Well, that's their privilege. The, the reality of the reality is you can't drill in the city anyway because you can't generate a big enough unit. But the city has boundaries beyond the, the nucleus of the town or the land all over the place. Take I also disagree with that. But take the town of Covert. Most of this is a rural area, farmland. Well, wait a minute. That's not a city. The the uh, the town of Covert is made up of one, one village, which occupies quite a small fraction of the town. The rest of it is rural land, with the exception of the federal uh, grazing area, the, the federal national forest. But they must know something to keep fracking out of their areas. What do they know that you're not telling us? Yeah. I don't have a clue. I'm telling you, fracking is a word, and we can manage the problems. No, we're, we're, we, we, we are welcome to disagree. That's the beauty of living in a society. Let me go to this guy. All right. Uh, thank you very much. And I, I'd like to thank every farmer in the room for who they are. <laughs> and, uh, they, their land, they're stewards of the land. And I think that's a really important ethic to maintain through all of this discussion here tonight, is that we are ethic, we are borrowing the land for our children in the future. And what we do to it today will impact them. My question to you, sir, based on that ethic, is why in God's name we are using 19th century techniques, drills into the ground to find a source in the geology of the earth, and draw it out and blow it all over the atmosphere and melt the polar ice caps and make a mess of the surface. Our air, cancer epidemics, and the like. Why in God's name can't we generate methane gas, which is what you're after here, on the surface? You can't Why can't farmers crop residue? Why can't, you know, forests? I know we do, but when I'm talking about industrial strength, methane production. Now why can't we do that? We can. Norway does it, Germany does it, Denmark does it. They all do. Huh? They all do. They all do. They all do. They all yeah, no, but I mean, you know, there's this new industry of, you know, I, I want to disagree with some of your, some of your basic assumptions something about 19th century uh, technology. I, I would like it's to basically to drilling into the ground to get energy. Why don't we produce it at the surface? We can do that. Farmers can help us do that. No, until you, until you either reduce the demand 
for BTU, for energy, or you converge to some other form of energy, solar, wind, nuclear, uh, you name it, you're going to need methane because that is the one of the major fuels, coal being the other one, oil, and, uh, and lesser extent, hydropower, and so on. Um, they're part of the present infrastructure. And they can be changed, but you're not going to change them in five years. You need why? Why can't you generate methane? I think that's all. I mean, why? You, you can, but you can't build them fast enough. You can't, you can't convert the infrastructure fast enough. To you make guys build the infrastructure. The infrastructure is with yeah. natural gas. All you're doing is drilling into the ground to find it. I'm proposing building a methane farm, just an experimental one to see if it'll work, on the surface of the planet. Well, there's research, there's research in that direction. But if you listen to our Cornell professor, he said we shouldn't be using methane at all. We should be exploiting other issues. No, there's, there's lots of ways to look at this. And I want an answer of why industry hasn't gone surface with methane. Probably it was it was cheaper to drill. It's probably cheaper to develop it at this point. Free enterprise system, you, you generate your energy by the, by the uh, cheapest think of method. The water, think of the butane that comes off of separating the gas, the wet gas, with with the benzenes and xylenes and all this is only, there's only benzenes and oil. But it's it's quite a scope of magnitude.
tainted water, polluted water wells, livestock deaths, and fish kills. The first six months of 2012, Chesapeake received 30 violations from the DEP, a total violations number in 2000, from, from 2008, they have received 284 violations. And also, one more, one more, Console Energy. Console Energy paid $5.5 million in fines for a $65,000 fish, uh, sorry, 65,000 fish that were killed, again, stemming from water pollution uh, in Pennsylvania that traveled down to West Virginia. And there were two uh, 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 industries that did separate investigations to find how those 65,000 fish died. The other question, this is just information that I want everybody to know. Where did you get it? Yeah, what, is, what did they find? All was on uh, uh, in, in newspapers. If you want, Demi I can Demi print it all out for you. I can clarify one thing, okay, guys? The one thing she did say wasn't correct. It was the $1.6 million for Philip 